Um, so my name is Hannah Greenwood, uh, Managing Director of Finsbury Associates, and today uh, we are delighted to be joined by Craig Brown, Senior Investment Specialist from one of our investment partners, Rathbones. Craig has been in the financial services industry for 15 years and currently runs assets of over 56 billion. During today's webinar, we will be doing a deep dive into the current investment world um, covering topics uh, from is a recession on its way? What do we need to know through to currency fluctuations and opportunities? Um, I'm delighted to get started, but before we do, anyone um, that would like to ask a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. We will uh, be answering them at the end. Um, but yeah, without further delay, Craig, welcome and over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Hannah. And um, thank you to everyone at Finsbury for asking me to do this. And thank you to your good selves who are dialing in, uh, giving me a bit of your time um, this afternoon. I uh, really appreciate that. I know everyone is incredibly busy and there's an awful lot going on um, at the moment. So, um, no, I appreciate that greatly. So um, today what I wanted to do, as Hannah said, is kind of talk you through broadly how we're seeing um, the, 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 the world from a multi-asset fund perspective, and then importantly, what we are doing in the portfolios as a result of those views. You know, we're, we're, how are we positioning the portfolios to protect, but not only not only to protect, but equally to take advantage of the opportunities that we see around us today. Um, because although at the moment things are, are pretty painful, um, as I'm sure you're you're all well aware. You know, you often get these opportunities once in a decade opportunities sometimes to get yourself in the right position. And every now and again, you know, really what makes the difference over those 10 year plus periods is making sure that you get your portfolio in the right shape during and coming out of these bear markets. Now, what I'm not going to do today at all is try and minimize uh, the pain that we felt across markets and that investors have felt across markets uh, at all. Often what you'll be told is, don't worry, it's all fine, it'll all come back. And actually, there's some there's some truth behind that sentiment. You know, markets largely do press ahead, you get these inevitable fluctuations. But, you know, to use an analogy, my wife's a bit of a, a nervous flyer at times. And the, the worst time to tell my wife um, that don't worry, all the turbulence that we find, the plane will land at the end of the day, is during the period where the plane is bouncing up and down and she's experiencing that turbulence. So often, you know, yes, there is some truth behind that. But what I'm not here to do today is to tell you that you shouldn't feel um, actually, you know, a little bit of that pain at the moment and the fact that things are a little bit uncertain. Um, just know that within the funds, you know, that's our job. Our day job is to help uh, navigate those trickier waters. So in that vein, absolutely, we have had a world of hurt this year. Um, you know, these are four kind of broad asset types just to show you that that pain has really been located across a wide swathe of markets. You've not only had, you know, the Nasdaq index um, off quite heavily this year. You've also had ARK Innovation, where the most pain has really been felt, those speculative technology areas. You've also had treasuries, long dated US treasuries, feeling a lot of that pain. Again, typically an asset that you would expect to balance off that risk in portfolios. Yet this year, they're actually causing large elements of pain. And then indeed, Bitcoin, an asset that's been pitched to many before as either an inflation hedge, as a, a diversifier, as a safe haven, as a store of value, again, is off heavily this year and has proven to perhaps, uh, certainly at this stage anyway, be none of those things in terms of giving you the diversification um, that you desired. So there have really been very few hiding places this year for portfolios, but it has been a year of not quite two halves, um, you know, more a kind of four months, four to, four to five months, and then the last kind of six weeks or so. And I mean, year to date, if you look at performance of US equities in particular, from a sector perspective, there is only one sector that has returned a positive uh, performance so far this year. And, you know, there'll be no prizes for guessing that was the energy sector. That was your only hiding place this year in US equities. You know, that sector was up some 31%. Over the course of half one, every other sector was indeed negative. So again, that pain has been broad. But what we've actually seen is the most pain has been in those speculative technology, those growthier areas. And I'll touch on why in a short while. But what we've seen over the last six weeks is a more broadening of that pain. It's really morphing into at the beginning of this year, we had that rotation from growthier stocks into value stocks, more cyclical stocks that you tend to get during 
periods of higher inflation. And we moved into what can now be termed more of a broad risk off sentiment, actually reflecting that, you know, fear around inflation is, is clearly much higher than it was. And, you know, that's a fear that we equally share. Um, you know, we've felt actually from the beginning of, uh, or sorry, the end of last year, we felt the UK was likely to be in a recession by the end of this year, um, even without the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And, and, and that really just kicked things into another gear for us for a number of reasons. The US as well is an area that we feel actually more comfortable with the US. You know, typically the consumer is in a healthier space. But again, if you look at things like the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now tracker, it's showing you that actually the next GDP print, we could technically be in a recession in the US already. Now, every recession isn't built equal. And it's important to remember that we probably haven't had a normal recession for some 20 years. The GFC in 2007, 2008 was not a normal recession. If I sort of take you back to that period of time, it did feel as though the world was falling down around your ears. You know, we were beginning to question whether the capitalist model uh, of economics would continue to work, whether our banking system was going to completely fall over in its entirety, whether the entire monetary system would indeed fall over. Now, that is not your run of the mill recession. That is not your run of the mill economic weakness. That was something which may only and hopefully again would only be seen once in a generation. That huge exogenous shock that is really a shock to everything about the system that we operate in from a financial perspective. You know, prior to that, really, you were going back to 1929 in the Great Depression when you saw that kind of huge existential crisis around financial markets and investing. So as I say, not all recessions are created equal. You can have shallow recessions, you can have deep, nasty recessions. Where this one will be clearly is remain, remains to be seen. And some of what I'm going to talk about later and how this pans out is likely to determine the path of that recessionary environment. So the first thing I wanted to start on, and really, you know, you can't escape at the moment talking about commodities. And there is a, largely a commodity crisis going on across the globe and it's it's a crisis of energy commodities it's a crisis of agricultural commodities and it's affecting nations in very different ways this chart for example example shows europe's reliance on on russian oil and russian fuels russian natu natural gas and germany is particularly susceptible to this and you know this was a a risk that we had to try and manage in the portfolios but there are different ways that you can look at these risks. You look from the high level when, you know, when Russia first invade Ukraine and you think, OK, do we have any Russian or Ukrainian exposure? And again, you know, for those that perhaps didn't hear from us during the time, uh, no, we didn't have any Russian or Ukrainian exposure in the portfolio. So that's kind of issue one dealt with. Issue two, when you're trying to manage this risk, is then around, OK, well, do I have lots of revenues and earnings in those countries? And again, we looked at every stock in the portfolio and we saw that there were marginal amounts of revenues generated from that area. But again, we're talking in the kind of low single digit percentages. So nothing really that made us think, right, that fundamentally changes the investment case for that particular, that particular stock. So again, we felt that we'd done the work to mitigate that risk. And then you start getting down to those third order impacts. And, you know, there are a couple of areas um, around that. And firstly, you know, this this picture on energy and oil. And look, some of this was already happening, quite frankly. You know, the move to renewables, which arguably was going too far, too fast. And I think, you know, the market is largely telling you that, you know, our reliance on fossil fuels is such that we can't just rip them out of our the way the world works. As, as sad as that is, and I'm sure there are lots of us that would wish that to be the case, Fossil fuels for generations have become so ingrained in the way that we live and work and operate that you can't just press the stop button one day. There has to be a transition. And I think some of that transition, arguably, was going too far too fast. And, you know, this commodity crisis we're seeing now is largely calling into question the speed of those transitions. I don't think anyone is arguing that we need to make those transitions, but we equally need to acknowledge that, that fossil fuels are going to have to be a part of that mix for probably longer than in a perfect world we would want to be the case. You know, we, we, we can't forget that only about 45, 46 percent 
of oil goes into our cars and our lorries and our trucks, etc. The rest of it goes into cosmetics, it goes into tarmac, it goes into medicines, it goes into plastics. And if you're going, unless you're going to find replacements for all of those, again, oil demand is going to remain. And again, we may find replacements for all of those, but it's not something that can happen overnight. So again, this energy price pressure was there going into this. And I think, you know, Russia invading Ukraine has clearly only exacerbated that. So again, one of those third order impacts we needed to think about in the funds was what happens in the event that again, Europe, uh, an, a region that's very susceptible to Russian energy supply, what happens if Germany, as an example, needs to ration fuel? And again, that's something that really has started to gain a lot of column inches over the last couple of weeks or so where Germany has passed legislation to allow this to happen. But it's something that we were talking about in February and March as a risk that we needed to try to quantify. So we needed to look again through our portfolio and establish, OK, what level of production facilities for companies that we own are located in Germany or Europe where they might be susceptible to energy rationing? And again, it's very unlikely for Germany to tell people to turn their lights off and to shut down their, their, their heating during the winter. What is far more likely, and again, what's been taking up those column inches, is Germany likely turning around to industry and manufacturing and saying, well, you can only run your plant for three days or four days a week. And clearly that impacts materially the output for those plants. And therefore, what you know is genuinely going to be the likely revenue output from those companies using those plants versus the expectation. It's always that reality versus expectation, which ultimately drives volatility. So again, we had to manage that quite closely. When we looked at that, we felt fairly comfortable actually that yes, we have some exposure, but it's not material enough to make us concerned that we are overexposed at that level to this particular risk. Now, the other area of this was, was food inflation. It's an area that again, we'd been speaking about coming into this year because we felt that again, what you were likely to see is more concern, more emphasis from governments on food security, on the supply of food, how easy we could get that food. Because COVID drove a lot of these concerns. When global supply chains gum up very quickly, countries begin to see how, how susceptible they are to these issues around supply chain disruption. And I think that's what a lot of countries saw during COVID, that the food supply wasn't perhaps as secure as they would like it to be. And obviously, the Russia and Ukraine conflict has only driven further inflation in food prices, with Ukraine accounting for large amounts of wheat, uh, the global wheat uh, crop. But we've also seen more protectionism around food supply. You had India, for example, banning the export of wheat because of a lower crop yield due to the heat wave. So again, all of these things are really focusing governments even more sharply than they were before on that food security. How quickly can I get the food? Can I grow it closer to home? Can I diversify my sources of food production? So what we wanted to do in the fund and an opportunity we saw over the longer term was to take an exposure in, in agricultural businesses that are really at the forefront of the research and development that's going on in these areas to allow crops to be grown perhaps in environments they weren't able to be grown in before. Or in the case of John Deere, who we've got exposure to in the portfolios, helping farmers do more with less ultimately, you know, whether that's autonomous tractors, whether that is looking at more precise uh, tilling, uh, which gives you better crop yields, or indeed precision application of pesticides, which has that dual uh, benefit of, of one, it gives a better bottom line to your, to your farmer because they're using less pesticide and two, you end up with a hardier crop because again, you've had that pesticide applied much more precisely to the crop, giving it a greater level of protection. There's also a third level um, benefit from that as well, that clearly it's better for the global environment to spray less pesticides into the, in, you know, onto the fields and, and, and into the ground. So again, these, um, th these companies are working on products, services, solutions, technology, that are going to be at the forefront of how we produce food going forward. Again, going back to that seed technologies, it's not just growing seeds where perhaps they couldn't be grown before, but I think we all have to acknowledge that weather patterns are going through more extremes these days. And again, creating seeds that can withstand those more extreme weather patterns is going to be another key to how we secure food supply. So again, it's not just about the risks in these areas. Some of these areas do throw up opportunities. And we think that agricultural business, that R&D spend in agriculture, is going to be a key beneficiary 
of where government and research and development spending is going to go over the next decade or so. So again, out of this commodity crisis, we can, we can see risk, but equally we have to balance that off with the opportunity. It's too easy to get bogged down, particularly when all the screens are red, when everything's um, built horrible, you're turning the screens on, they're red again. It's very easy to start getting bogged down in feeling overly negative. And sometimes what you actually need to do is try and think about the opportunity, building your wished for portfolio. Think about how you want to be positioned coming out of this, as I mentioned earlier. Inflation is a topic that I think, you know, ultimately I've probably never said the word, I haven't said the word inflation um, probably in my career as much as I have in the last six months, quite frankly. You can't escape it. It's the, it's the factor that's driving markets, that's driving central bank policy, that's driving consumer behaviour. And again, it, it's an important area that we have to talk about. So despite my, my inflation fatigue, we can't get away without talking about it, sadly, sadly for me. But again, inflation, as we all know, has been running at higher levels. Now, now our view is that inflation is likely to moderate come the end of Q1, start of Q2 next year for a few reasons. And this chart actually is, is a handy way to highlight why we think that's the case. So this chart breaks down US inflation by its component parts. And what you can very quickly see here is that the green bar energy is contributing quite a lot to that inflation number. Again, I don't need to tell everyone that, you know, you fill up your, 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 your car at the pumps, you feel that, you know, you, you pay your energy bills. You know, in the UK, we've had lots of energy price rises, as, you, as I'm sure you've seen in the news over the course of the last six months with more to come. Again, that all feeds into that energy price inflation. So it's of no surprise. However, don't forget that inflation is a year on year number. So as we move into the end of Q1, start of Q2 next year, the oil price is going to begin lapping the highs from when, inflate, when, when Russia first invaded Ukraine. Now, there are risks to that, of course. Russia could, for example, just shut off energy supply entirely to Europe. Or indeed, Europe could ramp up those sanctions even further to create more dislocation in that energy market. So there are risks to this. But all things being equal, our base case in our, in our minds is that as we begin to lap, unless energy and oil prices have moved up materially, if we're still at that $110 to $120 a barrel, dollar a barrel on oil, that green line is going to shrink materially. Now, it may not disappear entirely, of course, but it's going to shrink. It, we doubt that it's going to contribute the level to inflation that it is at the moment. So that's the green line. The orange line, the darker orange line, is goods inflation. And what you'll see there, actually, is the goods price inflation really ramped up in that kind of first half and going into the second half of 2021. And again, that's no surprise. U.S. consumers were given money in their pockets, two lots of helicopter money via checks dropped on their, on, on, on their doorsteps for every member of the family, plus additional tax credits that were given as well. So you had an economy that had been shut down for a large period of time. All of a sudden, they had lots of money and they were sitting in their homes thinking, I'm going to buy a new TV. I'm going to buy that new washer dryer. I'm going to buy that new dishwasher, that microwave, that toaster, whatever it was. All of those white, white goods, we saw a huge demand spike in those goods type orders. But that coincided with a continual issue around supply chain dislocation, not just physically because the ships couldn't get from A to B or couldn't get there fast enough and become unloaded, but equally had issues around semiconductors. And, you know, semiconductors goes into, go into everything that we produce, say fridge freezers, the lot. So again, without those semis with freight issues as well, you started to see that goods price inflation. Now, as we're pushing through the course of this year, we're starting to see consumer demand weaken. Certainly consumer sentiment is very weak. Gallup's poll of consumer confidence shows incredible weakness in consumer confidence. Also, when you look at retail sales, the absolute number of retail sales is higher. If you adjust that for inflation, retail sales have already rolled over. So people are spending more, but they're actually buying less. And there's only so long they can continue to spend more on buying less, until that demand completely falls away. So again, you are starting to see both a combination of weakness in demand on the good side, but equally some unblocking of those supply chains. So semiconductors now producing at a rate of around 15% higher than the long run average. You've got a supply response. Freight rates have fallen 38% from their highs. You're starting to see some of the pressure ease from those logistics issues. 
So between that and the weakness of demand, we'd expect that darker orange line materially shrinks by the beginning of next year. Now you've then got the blue line, the services. Now this is where we started to see really, as you see on the chart, ramping up to the back end of 21 and 20 into 2022. And this is where people have bought their fridge freezer, they'd bought their 65 inch TV, they'd bought their, um, their, their dishwasher, etc. And now because they are finally unleashed, they wanted to go out and go to the theater, go out for dinner, go on holiday. All of these pursuits, those more social services based pursuits, you saw really come to the fore and you began to see that, that price inflation. But again, with the Fed tightening monetary policy, with inflation running away slightly at this moment in time, we're starting to see that weakness. And again, going back to weaker consumer sentiment, weaker consumer confidence, all of this begins to pull down that, the, the likely trajectory for service price inflation. So for us, you know, when we start to build all these things together, we start to feel that there's a picture that really puts us moderating that inflation level down to that kind of maybe three and four percent. We don't think we're going back to, you know, um, the kind of environments of, you know, one percent, one and a bit percent inflation. We do think there'll be some stickiness and, and that lighter orange line food price inflation is likely one that's going to be a bit stickier than some of the others, quite frankly, for the reasons that I've mentioned earlier. But again, we think that three to four percent level all of a sudden Economies should be able to deal with that. Good companies should be able to pass that on and protect their margins. And wage growth should be able to keep up with that kind of inflation. Now, what we, what we hope we begin to see over the course of this year is that as inflation begins its path of moderation down, you start to remove the pressure from the Federal Reserve. Removing that pressure from the Federal Reserve to be quite so hawkish hopefully allows the market again to find some level of footing. But the important thing here, and I'm going to mention this probably time and time again through this, is you have to be selective. You have to be active. Some of these companies that, are, that have fallen this year aren't going to come back. Some of these companies that are defensives, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail shortly, are like, unlikely to protect you in a recessionary environment as well as, as they, they typically may have done in, in the past. So again, you have to be selective and you have to be active. We may, yet, we may yet see more, more, uh, more rate hikes, which is going to push yields higher. You have to be able to manage your duration risk in your fixed income, because if you don't, you're going to see a lot of pain from your fixed income. And again, I'll take you back to that first chart. If the bit that's meant to protect you is down 20, 20, 20, 22% this year, and your equities are off some 30, that's a pretty nasty outcome for someone that's meant to have a balanced portfolio. You've got to manage your duration and you've got to think outside the box when it comes to protection. That's absolutely what we have to focus on doing, what we've been focused on doing this year. Now, China and, and zero COVID policy has been something that we've been concerned about for a little while and for two reasons. Firstly, because the longer zero COVID policy goes on for in China, the longer there's potential supply chain dis disruptions and dislocations. But equally, the longer that it kind of elongates that chance of more and more stimulus being fed into the Chinese economy by the central bank, by the government. And to us, that's reasonably inflation. So what we don't want to see is a huge wave of stimulus from China, which ultimately is going to end up in further, um, further increases to commodity prices. So we need to really keep an eye on what China are doing here. And sadly for China, they're going to find it difficult to exit this zero COVID policy any time in the, in, in the immediate future. And that's down to a few issues. Firstly, around their booster uptake in the elderly population. And secondly, around a slightly lower level of efficacy from the Sinovac um, vaccine than some of the Western ones. And, you know, and, and I think the combination of those two factors have led, it to, led, led China to have to adopt this policy. There was some quite sensible modeling done and it, this wasn't the kind of stuff that you read on the, you know, the front page of the Daily Mail that's designed to scale. Pretty sensible stuff that looked at a base case that if China was to do away with zero COVID policy and go through another wave of, of, of Omicron, you could end up with one and a half million deaths as a result. And clearly China's a huge populace. But again, one and a half million deaths. You would likely have ICU, um, ICU demand 16 times above capacity. So you can see why China are in a situation at the moment that until they gain a greater level of booster uptake, particularly and again that elderly population, they're really likely going to have to be in and out of these kind of uh, targeted shutdowns and lockdowns. And we just hope again 
they do remain targeted, but it's a risk that we have to continue to focus on. We've got some limited exposure to China, very consumer focuses, the likes of the 10 cents and the AIA, the insurance company. So again, we feel reasonably well insulated in terms of the impact of this. We're not looking at you know, big Chinese kind of um, uh, sort of property companies or exporting companies. Um, but again, it is a factor we need to think about in the context of, of, of kind of global economics. Now, this, um, this question on the staples is, is really looking at those consumer staples markets and ones that tended to, in, in previous recessions, which as I've mentioned, you know, we, we, we do feel that there's a reasonable degree of likelihood we are, we, we are going to go into a recession, uh, albeit, again, doesn't mean it has to be a deep, horrible, nasty one, um, you know, depending on how things shake out. But a lot of people move to these defensive staple stocks. You know, companies that produce shampoos and conditioners and bleaches and, and, and fairy liquid, etc., because they're seen as defensive. They're seen as, well, look, it doesn't matter what's happening to the global economy. We all still wash our hair. We all still wash our dishes. We all still need to pour bleach down the toilet to clean it. And there is a, a huge degree of truth to that, of course. We all still do need those products. They are consumer staples products. But the difference now, though, versus previous um, cycles is that now, there is a much greater level of choice for consumers during these recessionary times. The likelihood of trade down, in our view, has materially increased. And don't just take my word for it. Listen to Sir Stuart Rose, who is over at ASDA. He was saying a couple of weeks ago that actually they were already seeing consumers trading down from branded goods to their ASDA own brand labels or other sort of cheaper brand labels. Because again, if you're in a recessionary environment, yes, you need the bleach. But are you likely to say, well, actually, I don't need to buy Domestos. I can buy A and other bleach, which is half the cost, probably does the same job. Because, again, the quality of these trade downs, these substitutes has increased materially over time. Or are you going to stick paying that heavy cost for Domestos and those branded goods? And there'll be an element that do, of course, there'll be an element that continue with, their, with, with, with owning the brands. But again, the, the, the way these staples have behaved in the past leads you to believe that that is a much more resilient source of revenue than we believe it is. You've got the likes in the UK of the Lidl's and the Aldi's that have not only taken market share from the supermarkets, but again, you know, their sort of own brand products are getting followings in their own rights. And again, they're materially cheaper than the ones that are, that are, that are produced by the Unilevers and the Reckitt Benkheisers of this world. So if their entire model is predicated on resilient demand and their stock prices and their valuation is predicated on very resilient demand during a recession, when actually is that demand going to be there? Can they pass prices on? Because again, this is the other issue. You settle at three to 4% inflation, perhaps you're in a recession or there's economic weakness out there, unemployment's a little bit higher. Again, what are the chances that you, as one of those consumer staples companies, can put the price of your shampoo up by five or six percent and not see that trade down effect? We think it's pretty unlikely and that pricing power impact, it can be huge in terms of what the long term returns are going to be like for the business, how the market will treat that business because of how robust and resilient that margin is. You have to keep thinking about how protective these margins are, particularly when inflation is going to be stuck around. So we really question how staple are these staples? And our answer is we don't think they're hugely staple. The products in and of themselves, yes. The brands, not so much. We've limited our exposure to almost nothing in this consumer staples area. And look, they've done well actually over the last six to eight weeks. But I think you roll forward to the end of this year or the beginning of next, we are in a recession. If inflation's moderated, but it's still running at that three, four percent level, I think you're going to start to see some disappointment in the numbers from some of these companies when they've not been able to pass that price pressure on, when they've had consumers trading down in larger numbers as really the inflation has begun to bite the wallets even further of those consumers. So again, we've got to question those old narratives. You know, a lot of people get in, sucked into these defensive stocks because they've always been defensive. You know, Sometimes history tells us things, but sometimes the game changes. And we think here the game has slightly changed in this consumer staples market. The other area that we have to do, we have, what we've got to do here is focus on quality. And you know that sounds incredibly obvious, but there are different ways that you can look at quality. And what we're trying to do with this is, is that there are a lot of companies that have fallen a very, very long way during this. And this goes back to needing to be active and selective. Some of those companies 
are very good companies that you would want to own for the long term. And to a certain extent, it's the baby going out with the bathwater. There's a whole other subset of those companies that, quite frankly, deserve what's happened to them perhaps over the last six months or so, because ultimately they aren't quality business models. Perhaps some of what was driving their price was largely a rational exuberance. You know, some of those speculative, speculative technology areas, the SPACs that were launched in the course of last year, those blank check companies, you know, what's happened in the crypto space and the NFT space. Some of this irrational exuberance had clearly crept in. And that's where you've seen the most pain. But what we need to do now is decouple that business risk from the stock price risk. What we can never do is mitigate stock price risk. Equities will always be volatile. That's the nature of equities because sentiment will drive volatility in equities as well as fundamentals. So equities are always going to be a more volatile asset class. We can't ever buy a company expecting that to never have any volatility in the equity price. The bit that we can control better, the bit that we can mitigate though, is the business risk. And this is thinking about whether these businesses are likely to come through a crisis, whether these businesses are likely to remain leaders in their market after a crisis, and whether these businesses are going to be able to maintain those margins during an inflationary period of time. What we do and the way we think about quality is we look at three factors. And again, you know, we, we look at we've looked at every single company that we own in the portfolio through this lens during the course of this period of weakness. And it's something we regularly do anyway, but more so uh, or more regularly during periods of crisis. We look at the net debt of that company. How indebted is that company? But ultimately, if your net debt level is high, if your leverage is high, one, rate hiking cycles can really hurt. you, And two, ultimately, you've got to service that debt. And if your top line is falling, you've still got a big debt service to pile, uh, pile to service rather, then ultimately that gives you low, a lower degree of optionality to ride through this and what you want to do coming out the other side. So you want to see companies with sensible levels of leverage, low and sensible levels of net debt. We need to look at the margins as well, because ultimately those margins are going to tell you, firstly, what value consumers place on those products. Are they willing to pay a higher margin? And equally, how resilient that margin may be during a crisis. Because ultimately, if I'm owning a company that's got a 40% margin, and look, maybe they can't pass on the whole price rise this year. Maybe they have to take a 300 basis point, 3% haircut to their margin. I'm still owning a company with 37% margin. If I own a company that's got a 4% margin and I take a 3% haircut, I'm not far from losing money. Uh, you know, I'm not far from doing away with my shareholder earnings at that point. So again, margin is a key factor we need to look at. And then lastly, free cash flow. Because again, you can do all sorts of accounting trickery. You can have accounts that have got asterisks everywhere and pages and pages of notes. The one thing you'll struggle to, to fall though is cash. Cash is cash. And cash also gives optionality. High levels of cash and cash flow returns ultimately give companies optionality during these crises. Optionality on how they might want to position themselves coming out of the crisis. Optionality on perhaps whether they want to undertake some M&A activity and pick up assets at a cheaper rate because stock prices have largely fallen across the board. But they're the three factors to us that determine the companies that we view as quality. And what we're doing at the moment is focusing on adding to those companies that we believe are high quality. But also over the last six months or so, there has been a lot of companies that were on our wish list over the last five years that quite frankly were the, were the ones that got away were the companies that we felt were high quality, interesting companies, fantastic leaders in their field. The valuation just moved away from us way too quickly. We could never get a position in that stock because the valuation was just pushing on. Well, now valuations in a lot of those stocks have come back to much more sensible levels. So we're able to now relook at those companies and establish, actually, is this a better entry point to buy this long-term winner? An example of that might be something like Apple. You know, we've long felt Apple is a very good company. There is it's sort of largely inarguable that, you know, the company has got huge amounts of net cash, but also throws off cash flow, is a leader in its field when it comes to the technology that it produces. However, it's always been valued, or certainly over the last few years, like a tech company on those more elevated multiples. And we felt for some time that actually Apple to us is more of a luxury goods company. It's more that kind of company where, you know, these aren't necessarily the cutting edge of new technological developments. A lot of these developments are iterative and they've become that luxury goods brand. So we felt that, look, we'd be happy to own a bit of Apple once it was valued like a luxury goods company, which wasn't forthcoming until a few weeks ago. 
And then a few weeks ago, it actually ended up trading on a valuation very similar to LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, so another luxury goods brand. And we saw that as an opportunity to add some exposure to Apple in the portfolio in a company that we believe will be a long-term winner, but at a much more attractive and sensible valuation. So again, during volatility, while everything feels like it's going a bit crazy around you, you have to keep your eye on these opportunities because again, we're building a portfolio that we want for the next decade. We're building our wished for portfolio because when we come out of this bear market, and we will come out of this bear market, exactly when, sadly, I can't tell you at this point in time, but of course we will come out of this bear market at some point. We want to know that we own a stable of high quality businesses that we've been able to add a much more attractive valuations during this period of bear market activity. So again, use the opportunity that this volatility and markets are giving you. And then lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, subscription models, um, you know, and, and really this is focused on that resiliency of earnings point again. And, you know, if you think about subscription models, you know, every man and his dog wanted a subscription model, uh, you know, as, 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 as their kind of investment of choice over the last sort of three, five years or so. You know, and there were lots of sensible reasons businesses moved to subscription models in the past. Think of Microsoft. You know, Microsoft used to sell you the disc. You had to go down to your local, um, you know, kind of electronic shop. You know, in the UK, it was PC World or Curry's or Dixon's. You get the disc, you go back home, you put it into your computer. It takes several hours um, and lots of loud noises out of the hard drive. All of a sudden, you've got your new operating system. Well, you've got Word and, and, and Excel and, and, and PowerPoint. Now, if you're anything like me, next year when they've got the new version, you probably don't bother driving down to PC World, getting the disc, spending the several hours uploading it. You probably think, well... Those developments are largely iterative. They're probably not going to change my life. So I'm going to carry on with this disc. And actually, I used to run those discs for years before they fell over and really couldn't do what I needed them to do. And then I would be forced to go down to PC World. Now, the problem for Microsoft, of course, is that if they're looking to allocate some research and development spend, some, some, some uh, capex to really drive um, you know, production of this, to, get, to know what they're getting on a return on investment, they need to know how many people are going to buy the disc. And they've quite frankly got no idea because all of us on this call would have a very different time scale over which we'd buy those different discs. They've got no guaranteed revenue every year from people that have this software. So they say, well, okay, what we'll do every year then is we're going to give you a download. You don't need to go down to PC World anymore and get your discs. You download it every year, the updates. You get all of our R&D every year and you just pay us 70 quid a month or $70 a month. Uh, sorry, $70 a year, not a month. That would be bloody expensive. Um, but yeah, you pay us that 70 quid um, a year. Now, the great thing for, um, for Microsoft is that all of a sudden, they know every year that they're getting that subscription revenue. So they know how much they can spend on R&D, what the return on investment is going to be. And for us as investors, we've got much clearer line of sight of what their revenues are in that business because we know what their subscriptions are. And that doesn't mean people will never cancel subscriptions, but as I'm sure you're all aware on this call, it's pretty hard to run a business these days without using these Microsoft solutions. It feels like the entire world's financial system runs on Excel, quite frankly, and I'm using PowerPoint right now to deliver this presentation. So again, it's quite hard to rip them out of the wallet. You don't want to be that first out of the wallet. And therefore, that combination of not being first out of the wallet and a subscription model should mean I should reward that company with a higher multiple because they've got resiliency of earnings. I can see those earnings for a longer period. Now, what we had during this sort of five year period, sort of before and during COVID, is you had a lot of companies changing subscription models and were getting rewarded like they were Microsoft, like it made the sense it did for Microsoft, but it was anything but. And, you know, the kind of prime example I would give of this is one day I was walking down uh, from Finsbury Circus to our office in London last year, and I noticed that a, a very well-known coffee shop um, was offering subscription coffee, and it was 20, uh, 20 pounds a month, it's now 25, but I guess that's, that's inflation for you ultimately, and you can have as much coffee as you like, well, I say as much coffee, I think it was five a day, but woe betide anyone that's going to drink more than five coffees um, a day. I, I wouldn't like to be in a meeting with that person. Um, but ultimately, you know, you had this model that was subscription. And ultimately, again, people looked at that and thought, that's great. I can get that line of sight of revenues. But to us, it doesn't make as much sense as it does for Microsoft. Because again, taking you back to that resiliency point, if you go through hard times, you know, your energy bill's gone up, your fuel's costing more at the pump, your weekly shop is costing more and more every week. What's the likelihood you're going to keep that coffee subscription? The first thing out of your wallet is you're going to be saying, do you know what? 
I'll buy a jar of Kenko or I'll or I'll just buy one coffee a day. Whatever it is, ultimately, that £25, we don't think is a particularly resilient part of a consumer's wallet. And the last place you want to be owning is a business that's been rewarded like it has resilience of earnings. But actually, it has none. And again, that's what we're finding out with some of these subscription based companies. They're rewarded like a Microsoft, like resilient subscription earnings. When push comes to shove, people cut these things very quickly. Netflix is a prime example. You know, Netflix were rewarded like those subscriptions were sacrosanct. It would only ever go in one direction. And we have the first ever print of negative subscriber growth. What happens? The stock is off some 30%. Because again, you're getting more competition in this area for Netflix now. You've got Disney Plus, you've got Paramount Plus now, you've got... Um, You've got HBO, you've got Peacock, you've got Sky that are entering this market more and more now. There's a huge amount of competition in this space. And again, going back to a period where you might see economic weakness, you see more pinches on, on, on consumer wallets. People aren't going to carry five and six subscriptions for television anymore. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to cut them down to zero and Netflix might not always be the one that goes. But if people go from five down to two or three, Netflix is probably going to lose some subscribers. There'll be some people that value Disney Plus over Netflix. You know, myself being one of them, given I've got a two and a four-year-old, if I cancelled Disney Plus, I would be absolutely for it. But I could probably cancel Netflix, actually, and, and I wouldn't get it in the neck from the kids. So ultimately, people will make those decisions. So to my mind, again, you had a company there that was perhaps valued like the subscription numbers were only ever going to go one way, which they're not. And you've got a company that's valued like, ultimately, it's incredibly resilient which we think, again, that resiliency might be in question coming economic weakness and the level of competition that's now in that market. I've covered an awful lot of ground um, there. So I hope I've given you, uh, you all a, a sense of, I guess, what we're thinking and how we're operating in the multi-asset funds, uh, you know, how we're viewing the world. I'm ha very happy now to take any questions um, from, from, from everyone on anything I've covered, anything I haven't covered that you want to hear more about. The, the, the floor is, is really yours, so please do ask away. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, anyone that's got a question, please uh, put it on the Q&A. Um, but Craig, I, I've got a question that we're always asked um, as, as financial advisors is why would we, um, and I think right now especially, it's, um, it's an interesting time. So. Um, there's always passive versus versus active management. And obviously, as we know, if you buy a passive fund uh, or a passive investment, it's it's much lower cost than, than active management. Um, but I'll, I'll hand over to you of uh, why it's important for active at the moment. Yeah, so I think look, I, the way I always try to frame these conversations is, is about value rather than cost. And, and ultimately, I'm a great believer in, in, in you get what you pay for largely. And, you know, there are inherent risks, I think, in any passive approach that because of the nature of passive, they can do very little about. I mentioned earlier the, the risk in, in duration of fixed income. Now, if you look at the average bond index, you know, particularly if I, if I look at uh, government bonds, as an example, you look at the average sort of uh, gilt index or US Treasury index, the duration in those indices is often 12 to 15 years. And what that means is ultimately the way that duration calculations work is that if you see a 1% rise in yield, your bond will fall in price by about the duration times the move in yield. So if you've got a 15-year duration index, yields move up 1%, you might expect to see a 15% drawdown in that, in that particular index. Now, as we know, bond yields have moved an awfully long way. And the issue with the passives is that you are just beholden to owning duration um, that's at the index level. And the reason duration has moved up is because lots of corporate treasurers and governments have termed debt out as long as they can at these cheap rates. So you've never taken ultimately as much interest rate risk for so little return as you are now when you invest in passives in that fixed income space. So the reason that our lower risk portfolio, as an example, has done so well versus many of those passives in that low risk space that carries a higher bond component is because we came into this year with very, very low levels of duration. Because to us, it made no sense. The risk reward was absolutely against owning duration. The pressure on yields was ultimately upwards. and We weren't getting compensated to take that interest rate risk. So we just don't take that interest rate risk. What we're doing now is as yields move up, as bonds get cheaper to buy, the calculation begins to move and we can start to edge a bit more into duration. Because again, duration, we think, will help you if we go into, if we do go into recession and end up with that flight to quality. 
but you have to stay active. And in the equity space, I think for all the reasons that I mentioned during um, during earlier, you know, that ultimately, yes, babies have been thrown out with bathwater. Great companies have fallen. There is a lot of dross out there still. There's a lot of bad companies that ultimately you want to avoid. And actually, some of what's driven performance this year has been what you haven't owned rather than what you do own. Have you avoided those biggest points of pain like the speculative technology firms in, in those kind of arc indices? Have you owned Netflix? Have you owned Meta? And actually, if the answer has been no, you've avoided some of those areas of most pain. So I think it's optionality on the upside and the ability to be selective in terms of where you want to place your business. Just going back to that slide I mentioned about business. Great. And we've just had a question through as well. Um, if the lockdowns in China ease continuously and their economy improves, what impact could would this have on the global economy? I, mean, I think ultimately it would be positive for the global economy, but it would just depend, in my view, on what level of stimulus it took to get that economy back on its feet. And I think the government have largely said they're going to do what it takes. So it's something we need to watch very carefully because if, you know, we've already seen, you know, again, the opposite pressure in China, you know, they've been cutting rates to stimulate their economy. What we don't want clearly is huge swathes of stimulus because that will be inflationary in our view to commodity prices. What we want actually is a nice stable China that doesn't pump the economy full of stimulus, but equally isn't going through these big lockdowns. And as I mentioned, I think ultimately, sadly, they're stuck probably operating lockdowns, but our hope certainly is that they can make them targeted, locking down smaller areas rather than locking down entire swathes of the country for extended periods of time. So um, you know, China ultimately is a big consumer market, is a big driver of global growth. We need China to be operating from a global level, but equally we need China to have some equilibrium. Again, we get one way or the other, you could have big inflation or you could have big supply chain dislocation because of which ultimately will end in more inflation again, because those freight rates I mentioned earlier that have off 38 percent of the highs. You start sh shutting Shanghai ports and, and, and all the ports on the Chinese coast. That's probably going to go back to those levels, back to those highs again, because you're going to see that dislocation. So China is incredibly important. It's very difficult to call which way it's going to go, because, again, with it being such a controlled economy, makes it largely slightly harder to predict uh, which way things are going to uh, going to go there. But, you know, our core view, I suppose, is that ultimately we think China should be able to weather this that's going on at the moment. Hopefully doesn't put a lot of stimulus in, but can just gently be cutting rates to stimulate the economy to avoid a recession. And again, watching that COVID process from now, because our, our concern is that you end up with large scale lockdowns and that could be very difficult. But as with anything COVID, quite frankly, you know, we said this all through 2020 and 2021. It it's really hard to legislate for what COVID does because it's impossible to know, um, quite frankly. So we just have to keep a watching brief on it. I know, sadly, that's probably not the most finite answer you were after, but that's kind of where we are at the moment. It's a very much a watching brief. Craig, well, I, I think you uh, answered all, all of the questions all the way through because that's uh, the end of the question. So I just want to say thank you for taking your time uh, to come and speak to our, our clients and uh, our listeners. No problem at all. And thank you for having me, uh, Hannah, and everyone at Finsbury Associates. It's, uh, it's great to be working with you guys. And, uh, and thank you to all the attendees for spending a bit of time listening to this afternoon. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Bye-bye.